came in our house, and it's slap dash mic. Rachel is completely frustrated, worn out, and beyond changing me in this slap dash mic. And what it is, is she gets frustrated by my lack of punctuation in my emails, my lack of uh, uh, presentation in meals that I provide for her. You know, I'm kind of, I work well in a prison, slop, slop. There you go, eat it. It still tastes the same, it just don't look so good. And it'll be gone in 10 minutes, so that's my, my rule. But she gets frustrated by all these little things and, and folding sheets. She's like, don't touch the sheet cupboard anymore. I was like, that's exactly what I've been working towards for years. <laughs> and so good, get on with it, please. And uh, so, but there is one thing that frustrates her more than anything. And it is my ability to buy things by looking at the picture and not reading what the thing is. So I'll go on to Amazon. I'll be like, I, I want to buy this. I did this. I, I want to buy this sat-nav holder for my car. So I'm like, sat-nav holder. So then I, I, I put it in, and then the picture comes up. I'm like, that's the one. It's got to be the one. Click it, buy it, go. And then it turns up. It's a lot quicker if you do it that way. You, you buy it. You don't spend too much time looking at it. And I'm sitting there. I get this sat-nav holder, and I'm, I'm trying to stick it where it goes and whatever. And, and Rachel's like, Mike, it says for a push bike. <laughs> so... So I, I, I've come to realize that there is some truth in what Rachel says, that you need to read into what you're buying before you buy it. I've, I've accepted that, but she's accepted. She's just not going to change me. But here's the thing. There is a true message in this for Christians, that you have to read into what you're buying when you buy Jesus Christ. Or you could become like a, and this is what some of the church is getting a little bit like around here today, or around the world today, is we're becoming a little bit like second century Marcion, where we, we take the God of the Old Testament and separate him from the New Testament, and we kind of shoot that one to the side because he's really like authoritative and, and does some really heavy stuff. And we take the one that we think is of the New Testament, which is all lovely, fluffy, and kind and wonderful. It's what I like to call selective theology. And when you have selective theology, you create a God in your image, you create a life of your choosing, and you have a sort of distorted picture of what the future events will be. But at the end of it, you will be disillusioned. You'll be so disillusioned because you're like, I thought Jesus was coming to give me whatever I ask in prayer. I thought, you know, and when you read scripture, you realize it says that everything in prayer, in, in God's will, if you look around scripture, you don't just take one scripture, you'll find that actually it says according to his will, what you ask in his will. And therefore, you know, asking for that Ferrari never comes, it just never comes, does it? You know, and, and I, you know, we've got to get some sort of realistic view of who Jesus is, because if we have a fictitious Jesus, one that will never, ever do anything that disappoints you, if we have this view of Jesus that will never tell anyone off, and if we have this view of Jesus that he's just lovely and grace is so big, we're going to be disillusioned. We're going to be disillusioned, and we're going to be what we kind of are today, mainly in the church that I look around, not just our church, around the world. We become impotent. Because we don't have the power and the authority that he promised us and he said that we need to take. Oh, when God sends Joshua, he doesn't say, you know, the land's yours, I've, I've, you know, I've swept it clean and I've made sure everything's in place. Just going, no, you've got to go and take the land. You've got to take possession of the land. And you will win those battles if you're faithful to me. If you don't turn left or right from the word, you will take that land. I will be with you. And the same with us. We have to take his word, we have to apply his word, and we have to look at Jesus for who he is and not who we want him to be. So then, the question is, how do we discover this real Jesus? Matthew 16, Jesus is about 120 miles away from Jerusalem, and he's in this place where there's every cult you can think of, and every single uh, thing that shouldn't be there is there. All the different God idol worships and all these different things, and Jesus is there, and he's saying, who do they say I am? And they say, well, you know, some think you're John the Baptist. Others think you're Elijah. Others think you're a prophet of some sort. Come back from the dead. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that these religious people killed those prophets. So like these prophets that they're, they're like revering. Say, oh, he could be, John, you know, he could be Elijah. He could be John the Baptist. And you know, John the Baptist just has his head cut off, you know, not long before this. By, by Herod, if I remember rightly. But you know, these people are talking about the prophets that they got rid of, and they're about to get rid of another one. And why did they get rid of them? Because they didn't like the word of God and the instruction that he brought. 
And the question I have to ask you today is, do you like the instruction that God brings for you? Because we all love to preach Jesus, fluffy Savior, you know, comes, he'll do anything for you, say a prayer in a service somewhere in the world. Yeah, sorry, I'm really sorry. Yeah, great. I'm a Christian now. I can still do what I want. I can go and do what I like. You know, I'm a Christian now. And everyone looks at the church and thinks, well, if that, you know, I think it was Brennan Manning um, that said that for Christians, it's like the thing that people can't believe in the world, the most unbelievable thing in the world is, is Christians. You know, they could probably get Jesus if the Christians weren't so unlike Jesus. Because it's Christians that make him so unbelievable because we look nothing like him. And that's a really, really important point. So we can preach this loving Jesus everywhere saviour and there's an element of truth to that because he is. But repentance in the church, don't worry about the world right now, in the church is becoming void of meaning. Repentance is becoming void of any meaning because we are creating our own definition of sin. We're saying, no, no, in a culture today, that's okay. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm okay because grace is all upon me. It's all right. Hyper grace, take it. But there's a danger in this. There's a great danger for the church because that's why we don't see the things that Jesus promised we would see. We get to the point where we say things like, a loving God could never allow people to go to hell. You know, we get to that sort of point in, in selective theology. No, it, it couldn't happen. We just make sure you don't read lots of the Bible and you'll, you'll be all right with that theology. And then we start to look at songs like, uh, what is that song? I think we, we sung it last night, actually. On that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And we're like, Christians are so offended by those words. They are so, honestly, I meet loads of Christians like, oh, I don't agree with those words. I'm like, which Bible are you reading? Which one are you reading? If you read it really carefully, you will find that you're creating a God in your own image. You are creating a God that you can handle. You're creating a God that doesn't do the things you don't want him to do. But that's not the God of the Bible. And then Jesus turns to Peter and says, but who do you say I am? He says, you are the son of the living God. Have you ever thought about what those words mean? Oh yes, Peter thinks that Jesus is the son of the living God. That's great, that's super. We think that too. What does it mean to be the son of the living God? What does that mean to us? I hear Christians that come to me and they say, oh, I got, they get a kick out of this. I got really angry at God and I'm shaking my fist at him and I swore at him. I gave him what for? And I look at them like, are you nuts? He's God Almighty, not God Almighty. Seriously, you're going to tell the God of the universe, who, by the way, before you give your life to Jesus, you are an enemy of God. That's what scripture says. You are an enemy of God. Think about that for a minute. You're going to shake your fist at him after he has saved you. You were dead in your sins. It's only by his grace that he came to you whilst you were dead in your sins to bring you back to life. And you're going to shake your fist at him and just swear at him and tell him what for. I tell you what, I don't want to be there when he comes back for you. Seriously. Yeah, be back soon. He'll be really pleased to see me. Don't, don't be so sure. You may not be pleased to see him if that's the relationship you've had with him all this time. I have an issue with that sort of theology. I know there's lamenting all over the Bible. There's lamenting, and then there's nutcase theology, which is I will just say what I want to God. Be very careful. Be very careful. I've had people come to me and say, God has given me permission to take drugs. Really? <laughs> Seriously? God has given you permission to pollute your body with something that actually, by the way, is causing so much death in the world. Just because you're taking it in the confines of your home, if you go down the chain of the people that are supplying you, and you go all the way back and back and back, you will find that there is slave trade involved in this, there is sexual trade involved in this. You are seeing dead people all over the place because of the people that provide your drugs. God said that's okay. I have an issue with that God. That's a very different God to the one I want to believe in. Christianity is becoming a little bit like a Craig David song. Do you remember that seven, day, seven days or something? You know, yeah. I go to church on a Sunday. I get drunk on a Monday. I sleep around on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday. Better rest it on a Friday and get drunk again on the Friday, Saturday. Can't do it. 
I guess what? I'm back at church on a Sunday, holy and looking good. Whoa. Is that going to cut it with God? Because that's the Christianity that I'm seeing more and more. The amount of people that I just, you know, I get it when someone comes to me, oh, I had a slip up. I get that. But when I talk to people and they say, I had a slip up, but I now think it's all right. The more I think about it, it's all right. I can sleep around. I can drink around. I can do whatever I want. And that's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay because of this, right? If you can do that forever, you have to be careful that your conscience isn't so seared that you're not really walking with God. That actually you received a Jesus that seemed like a good idea. Ticket to heaven. But he's not your Lord and Savior. And if he ain't your Lord and Savior, we've got a big issue. And we have to face these things and we have to look at these things and we have to work out, actually, have I convinced myself of something that isn't true? Am I deceiving myself? Because when I came to Christ, I was broken. And when I was broken, I was remade. And when I was remade, I still made mistakes. But when I made the mistakes, I was sad and I was down. I have a whole host of people that come across me. I have people that sit before me that are just utterly disgusted and hurt by their weakness in the flesh that has caused them to have a separation in the spirit. And they are broken and want God back. And the answer is, and he wants to come back because he loves you and he is full of grace. Then I have people that sit before me and say, it's all right. God's all right with this. No, he's not. And right now, you're not walking with him. You've squeezed him out of your life. And because of that, you're not seeing the power of Christ in your life. You're not seeing the healing of Christ in your life. And you need to take him seriously. Because Matthew 7, 21 says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the King of heaven, kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You know, if we could just take that line out, it would be okay, wouldn't it? But what it's saying is, you know, when we come to Jesus and think about the, the, the different conferences and things that we run today, and it's all about prophesying over here. I love a bit of prophecy. You know, it's all about a healing over here. It's all about get rid of the demons over there. And it says in Scripture that they will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Oh, those that do the will of my Father. Those that do the will of my Father who is in heaven. We need to take him seriously because he is full of grace. He is full of love. But he's not a fool. He's not a fool. God sees everything. And his desire for you is not for someone like me to stand up here with hell and damnation and make you feel really bad. No, his, his, his desire for you is to be set free of the things that are killing you. To be set free of the things that are hurting you to move you from this place over here that's in denial of the things that God doesn't like and move you over here to a place of freedom that says, you don't need anything but God. You don't need anything but God. Now, the time in my life I sat there thinking, God, I'm lonely. I need to meet someone and marry them and have a life. You don't because he's good enough. He's good enough. He's great enough. He can bring you all the peace and excitement. You know, you can have a really exciting time. You don't have to fold bed sheets for God. Huh? I, I, I'm, I'm happy, I'm with my wife, I love her, and God loves us too, and I'm there, and I'm happy. But, if you're not doing the bed sheets, don't mock it, honestly. Jude 4 says this about the ungodly. They pervert the grace of God, our God, into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. They pervert grace into a license of immorality. Do you know what that looks like? It looks a bit like this. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm at church on Sunday. I, I used to do this. And, and I'm going to go out this Friday. I'm going to get hammered. We're going to do the Zambukas. I think those drinks still exist. And we're just going to go really wild. And then I'm going to, that bird is coming, or, or guy, whatever you want, is coming home with me. And we're going to just, we're going to rock it all night. That's it. Sunday morning, oh, you know, I shouldn't have done it. But it's all right, girl. God is full of grace, isn't he? He's full of grace. That ain't going to wash too many times. Because if that becomes your normal way of life, then your normal way of life doesn't include God. And you have to question whether the God you received, you really genuinely received him or not. We have to ask that question. Who is Jesus to you? My answer to that is I think we need to rediscover some reverence in churches. 
I think we need to get back to the place where Jesus isn't just your mate, but he's also your Lord and your Savior. I think we need to get back to the place where we ask, you know, does a loving, forgiving God mean he's a soft touch? Does he become our servant even though he's on the throne now? You know, he came down, he came to, to serve and not to be served, but you know he's up there on the throne now. And that means that you revere him and you give him what he deserves. You know, I became a Christian, uh, uh, well, the beginning of it started in the back of a police car. Um, it was the only lift home I could get. And uh, so I'm in the back of this police car and, and I, I'd been drink driving. I'd run around Merston for about 45 minutes until eventually the police caught me and got the dogs out. And I'm like, I'm not messing with the dogs. Take me, take me now. And I'm in the back of this police car. I'd done all sorts of bad things. And these blokes are like, you're an idiot. And I'm like, yeah, I am. And, uh, and I'm sitting in the back of the car, they get out and they're having a discussion, they've done a breathalyzer, they said, oh, surprise, surprise, he's drunk. And um, I'm sitting in the back of the car and I thought, I need to pray, I think I need God's help now. And I said, look, God, if you help me this time, I genuinely will follow you forever and serve you. And, and, and he did help and I did get away with a lot. And the interesting thing is, what happened after that is he held me to it. I said, like, oh, thanks a lot. So I, I couldn't go anywhere without getting invited to an Alpha course. I couldn't go anywhere. I'm, I'm sitting in my office, and there's this great big Alpha sign outside my office. I'm like, why is that there? And, and then my girlfriend at the time rings up and says, your life's a mess, and, and we're all worried about you. You should come on an Alpha course, because I've been doing one since we split up for a week. I was like, oh, great. Um, like the one opposite me. So I ring up this sign, and then there's someone on the other end of the phone. who said, how did you find out about our Alpha course? I said, it's outside my office. He squinted it on the sign. She said, that was meant to come down two weeks ago. I I was like, oh great, he's at it again. Yeah, I'll come, all right? <laughs> yes, God, I will come. So I went to, I, I followed through and I went to this, this Alpha course. Long story short, over time I became a Christian. And then what did I do? I still went out and got drunk. I still went out and tried to sleep around. Uh, it wasn't that successful. Boat race like this don't happen very often. Um, <laughs> so you take every chance you can get. Uh, but here's the thing. I would come to church thinking it was okay to still do those things. I come and say sorry on Sunday morning, and it's all okay. And then I go back out on the Thursday night, cheaper drinks on Thursdays, and I do it all over again. All over again. And I thought that was okay. You know what God did? He took me on a journey, because he is gracious. And he took me on this journey. And in that journey, I met many, many things. I met depression. I met depression in the most incredible, horrible way. Anxiety, crippling, horrible. And I went through this, this horrible time. And I remember that also, as well as meeting depression on the way, I met shame. And I started to realize as I read the Bible uh, through gritted teeth, I was reading it and I was in utter shame at my lifestyle. I was thinking, how can I ever marry someone one day and tell them what I've done? How can I do that? How can I tell them about who I am? And I started to realize who I am. I just, I'm disgusted by that person. It needed a miracle for that to happen. And so I went through the depression and I went through the shame. And then I had a dream and I met the personified Satan who said, I own you. And I had the power to say, no, you don't own me. And then after that, the depression was healed. The anxiety went and my life completely and utterly changed. And all the things I thought was okay that wasn't was no longer okay. And in that journey, more than all of those difficult times, I met God. I didn't meet Jesus Almighty, uh, Almighty, by the way. I met the one who is going to be Lord and Savior. And what I found is on that journey that he took me through, he was preparing me. And the words that kept going through my head is, once you're through this journey, you will go into ministry. You are not strong enough without going through the anxiety and the depression that you've gone through to go into ministry because you will be crippled by the things that you will face. This is an important journey for you to go through in order to be strong enough to be a minister of my word. But before I could minister the word of God, I had to die first. I had to die first. I had to give it up because God was not happy for me to start that journey where I was. Before I could go on that journey, the old Mike had to die and a new one had to be raised up. That's the journey we all need to go on. We may not all be ministers, although we will be ministers of his word in some way, but before we can really be used for God, we've got to die. Unless the clubs, the pubs, the sleeping around, the drugs, 
and the attitudes and what, everything that is against the way of God, unless it dies, although it will creep up every now and then in you in a small way, unless it dies, you cannot go on and do the things that God wants you to do. It will get in the way. Who is Jesus? Well, he's gracious, but he's not weak. He is loving, but he's not blind to sin. He is saviour and he is also judge. And he will come back and judge the living and the dead. He is more than just the man that you get a ticket to heaven for free. He is greater than that. And therefore, he deserves the reverence that the Bible says that he deserves. But will his people give it to him? Let's think about Moses. He forgets to, to circumcise his son. What does it say? It says that God was burning with anger and he was going to kill him. Moses, God's man, he didn't obey God's word. And it says God was going to kill him. So Zippory's wife goes to him and, and, he, and she quickly whips off that, you know what, and throws it at his feet. You know, like you are a, a bride, bridegroom of blood, I think she called him. In other words, you're going to get me killed, son. Whip it off, get on with it. That's, that's what she was saying. And then God's anger subsided. But God was angry enough to kill him. But that's the Old Testament, God. We'll, we'll, we'll ignore that. Or what about uh, the Passover? That if you didn't have the blood on your, your door frames, he wipes out your firstborn. Do we think it's a different God? He did that. What about Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah? He's trying to work with God and say, if there's just 10 people in there, will you forgive them and not wipe the place out? Yeah, I'll do that. But the trouble is there wasn't. So he wiped it out. That's your God, by the way. He wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah. Killed all those people, those sinful people. He'd done it. That's your God. Don't hear that one preached every Sunday, do we? But then we get to the New Testament, because apparently the God of the New Testament is so much different. And you get to Ananias and Sapphira when they sell their land, and, and they're meant to be giving the money to God, and they hide some back, and they lie to the Holy Spirit. And what does God do? He strikes them dead. Do you think we might want to start taking God seriously? Who is Jesus? Well, let me read something to you. Let me read to you from, in fact, I'm going to share a parable with you. Parable of the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. This is Jesus speaking. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect its fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what would he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to the other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Now, I know the context of that scripture is spoken to the Pharisees. And it's spoken to the Pharisees because they are rejecting God's word and because they are neglecting God's people that he's sending with the messages. And what that passage, though, if you reject it in this day and age, you're no different to them. And what it is, is there's so, something very simple to weigh it up by. It is the weight of God's grace and the reality of God's judgment. What it is, is this, God keeps sending people and messengers to say, I want you, I love you, it's our age, it's their age, it's I love you, I want to send you, I've got grace for you. And they just keep killing the messenger because they don't want to accept the word of God in their lives. So the reality is if you send him away forever and you reject him and reject him and reject him and reject him, then there is no other place but his judgment. 
It is the weight of his grace and it is the reality of his judgment which is available to all of us if we neglect Jesus. And then listen to this. This is Revelation 19. This is about Jesus. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule over them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lord. Do you know what that says to me? It says he is faithful and he is true, but he judges and it says he makes war. It's the Jesus of the Bible we don't want anyone to know about. But when he comes back, he is not coming as weakness. He is not coming as meekness. He is not going to go to a cross and get nailed. He is coming back to judge and he is king. And if you are under his grace, full of his grace, washed in the blood of the lamb, you have nothing to worry about. But if you take him for granted, I question. I question whether you've even received him. Mark Twain says this, some people are troubled by the things in the Bible they cannot understand. The things that trouble me are the things I can understand. Are we willing to believe what God says in the Bible when it comes to belief and behavior? Or are we diluting his holy word, adjusting it to fit our choices and preferences? Remember, it is the only book you will ever read along with the author. I'd rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. I'm not trying to change your understanding of grace. God is loving, he is kind, and he is compassionate, but he's no fool. And when I look at the church today, I see too many people that are bigging themselves up, belittling God. Too many people that don't believe in the power of God anymore, but it is available. And it's available, but we're not seeing it because actually we have no reverence for God. But I'm not trying to change you and say God is this almighty guy that wants to come and smite everyone. It's the complete opposite. He says, I wish that no one will perish. I wish that no one will perish. But in order for that to happen, you have to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. But listen to this. If you're worried about grace, it says, this is God speaking of his own character. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. It says that he loves to the thousands and he punishes to the hundreds. What it's saying is God's grace always outweighs his judgment. His love always outweighs his anger. But there is righteous anger. And what it's saying is you must come under his grace and that you must be not throwing and perverting his grace back at him. That we must live, and if we live under his grace and we live with reverence towards God, his love will go further than you can ever imagine because he wishes not to bring his judgment. He wishes that no one will perish. But in a church that we live in today, we must not lose reverence for God. And I wonder right now as you sit there, what you're doing in your lives. What is it that God is not pleased with? What is it that is a blockage to God? Which brings me to the last point, and I'll read it again so that you can hear it, because these are a beautiful, beautiful promise to the church if you take hold of them. Back to Matthew 16, he says this to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. In other words, if you're a Christian today, it came through the Holy Spirit, not from man. We can't twist your arms to get you into the kingdom. It's only the Holy Spirit that can convince you. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. 
I will give you the keys to heaven. When he says that to Peter, he's not saying, I'm giving you the keys to heaven upstairs. Just come up when you feel like it and, you know, help yourself to what's in the kitchen. He's not saying that. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth. He's saying, I'm giving you the keys to affect this earth in a different way. He's, he's saying, I'm giving you the authority. I'm giving you the power to come and change lives, to set people free, to break the work of the enemy, to see people that are blind see again. I mean, think about it. What did, what did John the Baptist say? He said, are you the one to come? And Jesus said, report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those that have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The question is, are we stumbling on the account of the wrong Jesus? Are we stumbling over a Jesus that has no power? Are we stumbling over a Jesus that we like to keep in our pocket and bring him out when it feels like, I'm a Christian. Oh, not anymore. Where are we going tonight, boys? Is that the Jesus you've got? Because the one that John the Baptist talks about, the one that Jesus talks about to John the Baptist is a powerful Jesus. And the one that we hear about to Peter is, I am giving you the keys to the kingdom. And my question is, if you bought a house, would you forget to collect the keys? Would you collect the keys and stand outside and never go in and use anything in it? That would be stupid. And Jesus is saying to you today, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. You have the keys to the kingdom in your heart. You have the Holy Spirit in you. The reason we don't see him is not because he stopped working. It's because we're not walking with him. There's so much more available to us. And I'll end with a quick story. I've been really working on this and thinking about this over this last week. I've seen God move in hospitals. I've been privileged to walk into alleys and, and speak to gangs and pray over them and lay hands on them. And it's not because I'm special. It's because I've prayed and God, God, please give me the courage to go down and do this. And he does because we ask and we move. I've seen some incredible things and I thank God and I love it and I'm shocked that I've been able to do it. But actually he says we all can do it. And, you know, just on Friday, I'm sitting in the youth drop-in because there wasn't enough people to run it. So I, I said, oh, I'll come in, I'll do it. And I'm sitting with this young chap, and um, we're playing the computer together. He almost walked out at one stage because I had to tell him off and mucking around. And uh, so he went downstairs. I ran after him. I said, where are you going? I, you know, it's all right. I'm not annoyed with you. Just don't do it again, all right? Get back upstairs, you know. So he comes back in. We're sitting down playing the computer. I'm his best mate again. So we're playing Mario Kart, like all evangelists do. And uh, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting with this guy, and, uh, and I'm sitting there feeling challenged in my spirit. Am I going to play Mario Kart with this guy for the rest of his life until he dies and doesn't go to heaven? No. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, God, you know, I've, I've not done this for a while. What do I say? So I sit there and say, um, <clears throat> right, mate, um, what do you think about this God stuff then? And he looks at me and goes, it's all right. I say, ah, oh, it's good then. It's good. And uh, <laughs> I say to him, but, but, but where do you think you come from? And he's like, well, it's God, in it? I said, yes, you're right, but which one? And then we just opened up this great conversation. I said, do you think looking at the world, God would be pleased with us when he comes back? He goes, no, have you seen what we're doing to it? I said, yes. Yes, I have. Let me tell you a bit more. And he starts talking about all these different gods. I said, yeah, but there's only one that's died for you. And there's only one that loves you enough to die for you. And there's only one that says, you know what? Actually, the truth is, you are all sinners. All the others are going to tell you, oh, you're really nice. And you're going to be really fine. And that's the God of water or whatever there is out there. And uh, yeah, but this one says, actually, you've messed up the world, but I love you enough to forgive you. And he's like, wow. And I got to this stage where I was like, you've got to stop, Mike. You've got to stop. Because like, now you're doing it in your own strength. Just just leave it and pray in your head. So I left it and I said, it's raining. Do you want an umbrella? He said, yeah. I said, all right, I'll go get you an umbrella. And I went away and I prayed. I think, God, you've got to do something. Maybe I'll come back next week and he'll talk about you. I come back and he's gone to find Linz and he wants to know more. And they sit there for about half an hour opening scripture and he's saying, I'll believe it. He's given us the keys to the kingdom. He has given us the keys to the kingdom. The band want to come back on that note. I just want to say to you that we've got to stop saying everything's okay. And we can't run around saying we're going to prophesy over everyone that walks uh, without revering God. Because we do want to prophesy over everyone that walks in the power of God. Not doing the things that we want to say, but we want to hear the things he wants to say. And we've got to stop saying that God heals. And we've got to stop, well, we're not going to stop saying it. But what I mean is we've got, to not, we've got to stop just saying it and believe it. 
And we've got to stop saying that we want to run all these new services. And I know, let's have a forever rain, which is a great service over in Dorking. Super. But what comes out at the end of it? I hope everyone left there and went out and said, I'm going to pray for someone. And we've got to stop saying we want more prayer events and we want more of this without saying, and when we've done, we're going out there and we're going to pray for people. And when we're in a coffee shop, we're going to look stupid and foolish and say, excuse me. I see that you're reading something. Have you thought about reading a Bible? It's probably a cheesy one. Don't do that one. But I'll just say, <laughs> look for the Holy Spirit and remember you have the keys to the kingdom. And then see how he's going to move. But do not forget to have reverence for God. Because if you do, you will get beaten up trying to share the gospel. Because the Holy Spirit will not be there. Look at your lives and ask God, are you in it? Because he wants to be and he loves you. And he doesn't want to be coming and whipping you or something like that. He wants to give you the keys to the kingdom. So don't stare at the house. Go in and see what God has for you. Amen.